Welcome to Deep Bakery, a new web series of critical conversations exploring art, human rights journalism, and deep fakes, all in a time of infodemics. I'm Kat Cizek, Artistic Director of the Co-Creation Studio at MIT Open Documentary Lab. This series is a joint presentation between us and Witness, and this series is supported by Knight Foundation, BuzzFeed, and Vimeo. We've come together to examine, from our many different perspectives, deep fake technologies, their uses and misuses in art, journalism, and documentary. Hi, um, I'm Sam Gregory, Program Director at Witness. For those new to Witness uh, and to the series, we're a human rights organization that works with people who use video and technology to secure social justice. For those who are not familiar with deep fakes, we're talking about new ways to use artificial intelligence to make it look like someone said or did something they never did by swapping faces, simulating voices, or manipulating scenes. Today's episode is called Still Funny? Question mark, satire, deepfakes, and human rights globally, and I'll be moderating the conversation. Our panelists will talk for about 30 minutes, and we'll have time for your questions at the end. So please drop questions in whatever social channel you're in. We'll be checking and collecting your questions from wherever you are. Today, we're here to broaden the conversation about deepfakes to look both globally and through a human rights lit frame. We're also going to come back to a recurring question in this series about boundary lines as around deepfakes as satire, parody, and truth-telling. And we're going to talk about this in the context of both sophisticated deepfakes, but also what we've been calling shallow fakes, simpler edits or miscontextualizations of videos to falsely claim they're from an incorrect time or place or situation. First, human rights as values. A witness, we believe strongly that the international human rights framework provides a powerful normative structure for protecting free expression while also making purposeful choices to prevent harm. As platforms and governments try to manage and regulate manipulated media, human rights needs to be at the core. Secondly, any approach to manipulated media must look at this as a global problem, not one where the focus or the prioritization is on the US and Europe. We know from past experience the harms of letting platforms like Facebook neglect the impact of their choices in Myanmar, India, and Brazil just as much as the US. So our conversation here deliberately starts by centering experiences of shallow fakes and deep fakes in Africa. Thirdly, it's never been easy to make judgments about irony, satire, and free expression online. And it's been hard for many years to work out how to distinguish spoof from reality online, particularly when content is unmoored from its original context and or lacks the markers of irony. So that places us in a context of considering how we track and understand deep fakes and other manipulated media. How do we preserve the power of satire and enable people to see satire when it's intended how do we challenge the gaslighting of viewers when increasingly sophisticated media is passed off as reality or as satire, but is solely or primarily intended to deceive or harm? As we talk, we're in the middle of an escalating use of manipulated media in the US elections campaign, and similar patterns are emerging globally. So to talk about these questions and others, I'm delighted to be joined by three guests. Julia Wano is the executive director of Internet Sans Frontières, Internet Without Frontiers, Without Borders, excuse me, and among many other distinctions, a member of the Facebook Oversight Board. Professor Evelyn Aswad is a professor in international law at the University of Oklahoma and director of its Center for International Business and Human Rights. She's also a member of Facebook's Oversight Board. And my colleague Adebayo Okiowo is a human rights lawyer and witnesses program manager for Africa. He co-led the first regional expert meeting focused on preparing better for deepfakes in sub-Saharan Africa. I'm going to start off with some focused ideas from each participant, and then we'll open up for a group discussion before taking questions from the audience. And speaking of which, please put your questions in the chat whenever you have them. Our first speaker will be Julie. And to kick off our conversation, we're going to share two examples related to deepfakes and manipulated media from West Africa. Je suis le proconsul de France au Cameroun, pardon, l'ambassadeur de France au Cameroun, Christophe Guillou. Je voudrais dire quelques mots aux Camerounais et aux Camerounais. À savoir que je suis au Cameroun pour les intérêts de la République française. Je recommence. Je suis au Cameroun uniquement, exclusivement, essentiellement, nécessairement pour les intérêts de la République française. La République française, c'est la puissance de tutelle qui, en fait, a colonisé le Cameroun même si on a appelé sa territoire sous tutelle, mes ancêtres ont conquis ce territoire par la force. 
la ruse et le droit international. Une colonie, ça sert à être exploité. Si votre bien-être m'importe, notre vivre ensemble me préoccupe, me préoccupe tout autant. Car rappelons que la nation gabonaise est une et indivisible. Mais j'ai accompagné l'autre. Gabonaise, Gabonais. Avant toute chose, permettez-moi de vous adresser. Les soldats ont pensé, quand, dans leur discours, que la personne qui est venue lire le discours... Le spectacle désolant de ce discours de nouvel an à la nation est une honte aux yeux du monde pour notre pays qui a perdu sa dignité. Welcome, Julie. Let's jump in to talk more about these two clips. Very different contexts, these clips, very different impacts. Um, can you tell us more about the story of these clips? Um, let's, let's start with the clip of the French ambassador to Cameroon. Yeah, uh, the first clip is, um, uh, is a deep fake, uh, definitely, and I think it's quite obvious, of um, the French ambassador to Cameroon, who is uh, basically Uh, telling Cameroonians that he is uh, uh, a representative of the colonial power of France in Cameroon. And he's also suggesting a bit further into the clip that um, Cameroon is still a colony and that independence never really happened and that he is in the country to preserve uh, that uh, state, state of the, the country. And the second clip, is um, a, an address that was made by President Ali Bongo of uh, Cameroon, oh, sorry, of Gabon. <laughs> Here I am sharing fake news. No, no, it's President of Gabon, um, neighboring country of Cameroon. Uh, it, and it's interesting because at the time this address was made, it was in 2018, so December 2018, the president had just suffered a stroke in Saudi Arabia during a, a summit. And for two or three months, he was missing in the area. People, nobody knew where he was. And uh, when this clip came out, when this address was made, uh, he had been unseen uh, for three months and unheard of for three months. And even the, the government was barely giving information about his, uh, his state of health. And um, when this clip appeared on Facebook and on the national TV, Very rapidly, people doubted of the veracity of the of the clip and doubted that it was really the president making that address. So we were many activists reached out to us, and uh, uh, while it is true that um, I mean, it's it, most of the experts err on the side of this not being a deep fake, but nevertheless, at the time there was a huge doubt, and that doubt has led to the country witnessing its second coup attempt in its whole history it's in, in its whole modern history so yes two different contexts with two different impacts one in which almost i mean it could almost led to overthrowing the current regime so um very interesting clips um, and and cases here to discuss julie let me ask one follow-up on on the first clip uh, what was the impact of that clip how did people react to it so There, there were two reactions, and I think that's why it's, it's interesting to mention this case. Um, on the one hand, Cameroonian citizens, well, knew it wasn't a, it, it wasn't a real video, it wasn't a real clip, uh, because first of all, the, the person who shared it, uh, he's a professor um, uh, in France, a Cameroonian activist and professor uh, who is very opposed to the current Cameroonian regime, and he's um, campaigning along with uh, opposition parties in the country. So he shared it on Facebook and on YouTube saying, this is a deep fake. He, oh, people, look, this is a deep fake of the, um, sorry, the French ambassador telling us the truth about Cameroon. And it was perceived, perceived that way. Um, but uh, through a partnership between uh, Facebook and um, the observers, observers being a program of, France 24, France 24 being uh, the French international media. So through a program, a fact-checking program and partnership between Facebook and the observers, the observers uh, have, well, labeled this clip as partially false. And I think it's interesting because 
it's it's first of all we don't really know what's partially false uh there is a huge discussion on you know the relationship that exists between france and its former colonial empire and many and many of these discussions are around are on the side of there's never been an independence and a lot of people believe that and a lot of historians believe that because of certain you know agreements that still exist between the country the different countries this on the one hand we don't know what what was labeled actually partially false and on the other hand it's um it, it it's difficult because a satire is obviously false so do you really have to say that it's false or do you have to call it you know the way it is which is a satire because mm, what what we discussed that in terms of some concept when we 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 were sent this case was if you label it false then it it, it well it's purely it has consequences and uh whoever shares this clip will be labeled as someone sharing fake news and we know how facebook treats fake news at the moment facebook and other uh, social media so we thought it was it was important to have this debate because it, it questions to, to the, the extent to which by fighting fake news platforms actually contribute in silencing important debates and an expression in countries that desperately need that de those debates and expression and it's even to the point that the, the ambassador himself tweeted the article written by the observers france 24's observers uh, in which the the clip was labeled as partially false he tweeted the the the, the fact checking as well this clip is fake news don't share it so for us, it was it was important to 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 question this because it shows to the extent to which the decisions made by platforms is impacting democracy and debate in in countries uh, and specifically the fight against fake news. And on the case of uh, President Ali Bongo, uh, it was interesting to to mention it as well because for us at the time it was obvious platforms should have done something about this, should have at least said there is a debate about this. Um, and I even think that doing so, this case was two years ago, doing so would have helped platforms deal with the amount of manipulative media that we have now. If the platform, or and even Twitter, I'm talking about Facebook because it was aired on Facebook Live, if it had been taken very seriously from the beginning, not waiting one or two years like we've seen, well, it would have helped Facebook's policy teams and um, you know disinformation teams to you know nurture discussions on whatever happens here in in during the U.S. elections two two years from now, and that's exactly what we're seeing. And we're seeing that platforms are more or less I wouldn't say unprepared, but you know they're making decisions that can be questionable. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Those two clips are such a good introduction to so many of the themes we're talking about. So um, I'd like to turn over now to Bio to talk uh, a little bit about some of the trends and concerns you see from your work around shallow fakes and deep fakes more broadly in Africa. Uh, it's it's good to see you, Bio. Um, so, so last year in November, you co-organized an expert convening in South Africa uh, that brought together journalists, activists, civic movement leaders, and other experts to talk about how to prepare better for deep fakes on the continent. Um, so there's more information from that convening um, and similar ones in Witness uh, uh, that Witness has hosted globally at the link on the screen. Um, and Bio, can I turn to you to talk about some of the key trends you're seeing on the African continent in this area? Hi, Sam, it's good to see you as well. And thanks to everybody who has joined us for this session. Yes, like you did mention, we had a, a workshop in South Africa last year, which brought together activists, journalists, and other stakeholders in this space. And we had that in partnership human rights and had a conversation as part of decentering this whole issue from just it being focused on the US and Europe and start to think about how it impacts on Africa, Africans in Africa as a whole. And one of the key, I mean, we had several findings from that workshop. I think I'll just highlight three because it's impossible to go through all of it. Um, I would recommend that you kindly go check out some of the reports we put out on this issue subsequently. But some of the key findings we, we got from that workshop include, for instance, there isn't yet a prevalence of deep fakes on the continent. Rather, what we have more often are shallow fakes, even though that's like a young into deep fakes. So we need media literacy 
because if we engage in a lot of media literacy on how communities and general populace can identify shallow fakes, it sets the stage for quality of deep fakes being com becoming more rampant. And so we, we felt that that was a key finding from that workshop. Media literacy kept coming up over and over again because not a lot of people still know how to quickly identify or spot a shallow fake. And of course, that is very, very prevalent on the continent, miscontextualization, sharing of stuff that was not relevant to some of the issues. And it would have gone viral before it stopped in its track. And it would have led to a lot of misinformation as a result. And the second thing that I would highlight from our findings during that workshop is that there isn't enough capacity on the side of journalists. So the tools for spotting and countering deep fakes at the moment is quite a luxury and we need to then be able to empower more journalists and, and media houses on the continent to know how to apply the relevant tools to spot the, the deep fakes and train them appropriately because they are at the forefront. At the moment, some of the journalists themselves are grappling with how to identify these deep fakes and we've seen instances on the continent where things have been shared and they have resorted to be inappropriate, inaccurate and where, where, while we've seen some accountability on the side of some of these individuals and groups, not a lot of people have been held accountable as well. And that has led to a lot of problems around misinformation. And thirdly, I would highlight would be that platforms themselves need to pay more attention to places outside of the US and Europe, because it's already evident, even in the way you see that companies like Twitter do not have any base, any regional office in, in Africa. And Facebook only has a very minimum, very, very little team in parts of Africa. That already sig signals the fact that they haven't prioritized yet. And the problem with that is when you start to have issues of deep fakes or shallow fakes emerge out of the continent, the local context will be lost. You can't have people sitting in Washington or in, in um in Paris trying to decide whether something that has emerged from the continent is a shallow fake or a deep fake, which will lack in the local context, the language will be lost. So there needs to be some investment on the part and commitment from the part of Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms towards countering this issue, but also by also engaging with local activists and journalists and all of that. And in the bid to make sure we push back against shallow fakes and deep fakes, we also must ensure that we are not getting to a space of deleting everything that appears to be deep fake or shallow fake because we run the risk also of taking off the internet some very key evidence of human rights violations, which is also a space that witness is very, very particular about. Thank you, Bio, and, and we'll come back to some of those questions about the threats from deep fakes on the continent, uh, hopefully later in the conversation. So uh, I'd like to turn now to Evelyn to talk about how we can use the human rights framework to think about these manipulated media. Um, as Julius highlighted, we this is complicated. We don't want to suppress or dismiss legitimate speech, and we need to be very attentive to the real world consequences of both manipulated media and the suspicion of manipulation, as in the case of the president of Gabon. Can you walk us through how to think about this? Yes, sure. And uh, thank you, Sam, for having me on this program. So I think it is very important, as Witness is saying, to take a human rights approach to these very complex uh, questions. And under international human rights law standards, um, you know, we start with a presumption very heavily in favor of broad protections for speech, the transmission of ideas, receiving them, ideas of any kind over borders through any media. Now, uh, international human rights standards do allow for uh, limiting speech or burdening speech, but the speech regulator must meet a three-part test. And this is uh, an, a one strike and you're out test. All three tests uh, must be met. And they're known as the legality, legitimacy, and necessity tests. So under the legality test, any attempt to regulate speech um, must not, among other things, be vague or overly broad. So if we start seeing legislation to deal with deep fakes or manipulated media, we need to be very attentive that they are very particular in giving notice of what is uh, being limited and, and in not being overly broad in doing so. Um, this prong also has some due process uh, protections uh, built into it. Uh, the second test is legitimacy. And that means the purpose for limiting the speech must be a legitimate public interest objective, such as public health or national security. 
Um, now, if uh, a deep fake legislation were just to be a pretext to protect uh, an existing government or regime or, or head of state, that would not be acceptable. But there are legitimate public interest reasons that are triggered in the deep fake scenarios that we've been talking about that uh, could pass uh, this test. Now, the third test, uh, necessity, I think is where it would be very important to have a very interdisciplinary, multi stakeholder approach to assessing when is it necessary to limit speech. And um, here we have a three part uh, human rights due diligence test that needs to be assessed. So the first part of determining if something is the least intrusive means is, um, or the least intrusive burden on speech uh, is, is it really necessary to limit the speech to achieve uh, the legitimate public interest objective? So for in the deep fake context, uh, questions we might ask ourselves here are, um, are governments or platforms investing enough in digital literacy and media literacy? Um, another question we might ask are, are governments and, and uh, platforms investing in technologies that would empower consumers to be able to realize when they are looking at a deep fake or a manipulated uh, other type of manipulated media? If we assess those options and we still come to the conclusion that the legitimate public interest is still not served, then we go to the second step, which would mean looking at a continuum of options that burden on speech and then choosing the least burdensome one. So for example, on that spectrum, and again, this would take a multi-stakeholder approach to brainstorming, on one end, you might have a requirement for some kind of marking so that uh, people know they're looking at manipulated media, even if it's shared even if it was originally in a context where it was obvious, it might be shared in a context where it wasn't obvious. And you look at a variety of other options in terms of um, uh, the reach of such content, uh, the platforms uh, amplifying it, et cetera, all the way to the end of the spectrum banning uh, something or banning a, a user from a platform. So that would be your continuum. And you have that conversation of what's the least intrusive means to achieve your legitimate purpose. Uh, and then the third part, is um, monitoring if the burden on speech is working or is it counterproductive? If it's not, it, it cannot be uh, upheld under international human rights standards. You are banning speech without achieving a, uh, a legitimate uh, objective. And I would just make one final note here that uh, these standards, international human rights law standards, um, were taken from um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 19, um, and really apply to state actors. But thanks to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, the international community has called on businesses, including platforms, to respect these same standards um, in their content moderation. And uh, because a lot of the platforms are based in the United States, I would just mention that the United States has on numerous occasions called on all American um, companies to treat the UN guiding principles on business and human rights as a minimum standard in their operations. Thank you, Evelyn. That that was a tremendous um, explanation of the framework very quickly as well. I think often people are, are afraid of human rights because they assume it's going to be incredibly complex um, or esoteric. And I think just for, for those watching, just a very there's a very clear way to think through this. Now, obviously, we have to place that in a discussion, a multi-stakeholder discussion to do it right. Um, thank you for that excellent grounding in the realities and the frameworks. Um, I'd like to open us up uh, for a discussion. Um, let me remind viewers uh, to please add your questions into the comments or whatever platform you're watching, and we'll come to them shortly. Um, and uh, glad to have Julia and Adebayo back joining us. Um, I think there are so many directions we could go on questions. Um, I, I think maybe I just want to pick up straight away kind of um, one one question that's obviously hanging in the air here, which is around what should platforms do? Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing at the moment um, an, an escalation of a range of these manipulated media. There are more of them, they're being deployed more frequently. So, so maybe just to start, and, and this could be a first step, um, uh, what should platforms do in this space to respond to this, bearing in mind the human rights framework, bearing in mind the context that, uh, Julie, that uh, you and Adebayo have shared? And, and maybe I, feel I can just go to each person just for a short, answer there and I'll start with Julie. Yes, thank you, Sam. And thanks so much to Adebayo and Evelyn. This was really fantastic. Um, I I will speak for what should platform do, do regarding context. 
Uh, and I will, uh, you know, follow up on Evelyn's uh, multi-stakeholder approach. That's so essential. Uh, we know that, for instance, before launching their products, most of the platforms don't always conduct human rights impact assessment. So studying assessment, which would help them to know in advance proactively whether or not their product in the way they are deployed would have pro would have negative impacts on societies. But to do that, you need to hear from the people who will use your platform. And these people are represented by different civil society organizations, digital rights organizations, of course, but beyond that, women's rights organizations, uh, consumer organizations, there's so many. So I think it's important to uh, for platforms to have this channel of communication and con direct connection to these groups, because not doing so will always lead us to reacting to problems instead of imagining that the problems could happen and finding the solutions to them. So I'm really pushing a lot for more channels of communication between uh, platform team, uh, sorry, platforms teams and, uh, and, and civil society organization. And even beyond the launch, once the product is out there, how do you make sure on a daily basis that, you know, the way the tool is used, it's not weaponized or it's not mis misused by bad actors. So to do that, you still need to communicate very often with civil society organization and even to some extent embed some of them in the work that you do. Um, at Antoine Frontier, for instance, on another subject which is related to hate speech, we have been uh, offering to platform uh, to work with a network of organizations that we have trained on the issue of hate speech using methodologies that exist out there in international human rights law. And, uh, and this network is so valuable because it is on the one hand trained on issues around hate speech, sometimes even better than certain platforms, to be honest. But um, beyond that, they also know very well how the, what what's buzzing, like to use a, <laughs> a buzzword, uh, but, uh, and also what making, what's making the headlines and what could go wrong. So I think this, this very acute knowledge and expertise should be harnessed more by platforms and, you know, so that we can go a bit away from that dialogue between governments and companies because we know how that ends and it usually ends against freedom of expression. Thank you, Julie. Can I go to bio to you for, for one, one thing you'd like to see the platforms doing in this area? Yeah, um, I absolutely agree with what Julie has said, but if I were to add on to that, it would be to say there should be a lot of transparency and sincerity from the part of the platforms themselves. Um, we know that Facebook, Twitter are taking steps towards being um, more accountable about these issues and for instance, they're developing policies around these issues. But again, we do not want it to be just for some sort of, for the sake of it, because people have asked for these things to be done. Let there be sincerity and transparency and let them, let them not avoid taking accountability and responsibility for some of these issues because they have set up committees, some boards, oversight boards and things like that. At the end of the day, the platforms must still take responsibility. And because they have involved some civil society groups and stakeholders, isn't the excuse for them to deflect away from the responsibility ultimately that is that of the platforms themselves and of course being african please involve african in these conversations so not only let it be an afterthought let it be front and center because the issues just as well impact on africa as much as it does in the global north thank you bio and uh, evelyn is there anything you would encourage as an immediate first step uh, in this area of platforms uh, yes, thank you. Just uh, building a little bit on what J Julie was mentioning, uh, their lack of human rights impact assessments, you know, not only should they be conducting them with a global multi-stakeholder input, um, but they should be releasing them. We should be seeing them for each change to their platform content rules, including with regard to deep fakes and manipulated media. And I hope that, you know, going forward, civil society will be very, um, demanding when they issue these changes in asking to see the human rights impact assessment. At this point, the UN guiding principles have been adopted since uh, 2011. So we're always, almost coming on their 10 year anniversary. And those principles call for those human rights impact assessments to be undertaken and released. Um, so we should be expecting more from the platforms at this point. Thank you. 
all. Uh, I'm going to take a few more questions and address them maybe to specific people, but I encourage anyone else to jump in. Just let me know if you want to, to weigh in on a question. Um, Bio, let me uh, ask about a question of kind of extreme views and, and polarization and kind of our expectations of the other. Like we live in very polarized societies. Um, and uh, there was a, there's an internet law called Pose Law uh, that uh, is like one of those kind of, it's not a law law, of course, it's a, um, you know, one of those things people say on the internet. Um, and and Pose Law goes something like that any online parody of an extreme viewpoint is indistinguishable from the reality of that extreme viewpoint, right? So it's very hard to, to comment on extreme um, views without it being very similar to extreme views. Uh, and we've also heard a lot about people who share miscontextualized media saying, look, I know this isn't exactly what it is, but it represents something very close to an underlying reality of something I face or of what I perceive in my political opponents. And I know you've been thinking about that and looking at some of those comparative examples. And I wonder if you could talk about that and maybe the, the Burna Boy example uh, from Nigeria and South Africa. Absolutely, Sam. So yes, I think let me just start off by giving the Burna Boy example and then make a, a bit of an explanation around the question. So for those who don't know, um, I'll be surprised if you do not know actually Burner Boy. That means you're not listening to Nigerian music at all. <laughs> but Burner Boy is one of the very um, foremost uh, Nigerian artists, music artists. In fact, he, he dubs himself as the African giant. Um, so he's been, of course, very out, outspoken about human rights and uh, making sure that people do not get oppressed on the continent, that governments do the right thing. And so being Nigerian, um, he spoke out about the xenophobic attacks in South Africa last year against foreigners, including Nigerians. And um, in his very passionate outburst, he did share some videos which were of xenophobic attacks against foreigners, but which were from a previous time. And for that reason, a number of South Africans were very upset because already people felt that the issue of xenophobia was being blown out of proportion and that he was adding fuel to the fire by sharing some video from a previous era. Um, so when he was called out on that, he eventually um, deleted the post, but maintained that nonetheless, xenophobic attacks are going on in South Africa. And so his point remains valid that South Africans and South African government need to do something specific about the the attacks against foreigners. And so that goes to the point of when people do think that, well, even though what I shared is misinformation or miscontextualization, it doesn't take away from the fact that that is the reality on the ground. But we must be very wary of that because we can't in any way encourage any miscontextualization. It diminishes our reliability and the truth of our own story. Um, I, I think that every individual activist group must take responsibility for sharing authentic information so that it does not give the oppressive governments also a reason to undermine our truth because that is what they will continue to go to as an excuse and say, oh, but you shared this misinformation the other time. How can we trust that what you're sharing now is authentic? And that would then impact on us being able to pick out the truth of what communities might be facing and which needs urgent attention. If I could just you, uh, rapidly on what uh, I was saying, uh, I wholeheartedly agree with the the importance of n avoiding as much as possible miscontextualization and avoiding as much as possible as possible. Sorry, <laughs> it's very hard. As avoid as much as possible uh, the um, the sharing of, of, of misinformation because indeed that is used as an excuse by repressive regime who before had difficulty ju justifying censorship, but now it's very easy for them to do so. They, they can say, oh, Facebook, Twitter are not doing anything to fight against hate speech and fake news. So I just have no other choice than to block these platforms. And increasingly people agree with that discourse because of course they don't want their country to become, you know, a heaven for misinformation, disinformation and all these negative content that do have consequences offline. So I think it's in what, what Bio is saying so essential because it 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 goes further, it's just beyond you know the, the, the importance of 
having the, the truth, it also goes to the importance of having even access to the information and access to a platform of expression. That's the first thing that I wanted to stress on. And the second thing, uh, when when we talk about um, you know context, when we think of the fact checking networks that are being created by uh, platforms at the moment, we can question that as well. Um, I personally find it very interesting that in the case of the Cameroonian deep fake, which is not, I mean, it's obviously a deep fake, but it's not, it's not, it was not made to deceive because the author obviously said it was, it was it wasn't a real clip. But when you have a French media, you know, funded by the French government, which is which is asked by Facebook and other platforms to give its opinion on the veracity of that clip. It, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting, right? So I think it would be interesting as well for platforms to diversify um, the network of fact checkers um, because, and it's not in only in the case of the Cameroonian, um, you know, debate. It, it goes well beyond even in the U.S. and, and many other places of the world uh, who are well fact checking the fact checkers. I think that's how we we say it. So uh, it's important when even when we talk about the, the mechanism to reinstate the truth uh, or reinstate context to refer to people who know that context as well and media organizations particularly. So it goes back to what you were saying, Bio, on the importance of training as well, newsrooms in, in on the continent, which have probably less advanced on certain techniques to identify this fake. So yeah, wanted to specify this. Great. Uh, I, I want to pick up and note that uh, one of the things that Bio and myself and our colleagues at Witness heard when we held uh, the expert convening in, in South Africa was, you know, the real perception from people of the threat to this sort of fragile ability to show what's wrong with citizen media and the ability of the state to weaponize the concept of deep fakes to both target activists, but also dismiss activists and dismiss um, alternative sources of media. So I think uh, we heard that very strongly um, echoed. Uh, I want to put a question out that uh, is coming up um, uh, around context, and it's picking up actually on something we've we've been talking about. It's you know it's when we come to satire and when we come to content we encounter online, but particularly satire, it's critical that it have markers that show us that it's ironic, right? We look and go, oh, this is clearly satire. And when we look at the uh, the Cameroon video, it's clearly satire, right? Like this is meant to be poking fun, um, but also making a political point as it does that. Um, and a fundamental problem that we have online is that often contextual information that something is satire is lost when it's shared, right? So when it gets taken from a site. And what we're seeing more and more is we're seeing that weaponized and we're seeing the public gaslit. So what I mean by that is um, uh, there are videos that are created on supposed satire sites where there is no intention they're going to be used and seen on that site. They're going to be reshared, for example, to attack a presidential uh, candidate. Um, so the, the satire is gaslighting uh, in the sense of the phrase being like when you say, I don't, I don't think, you know, when you, when you challenge it, people say, well, didn't you get that it was funny, right? Didn't you understand that was satire when it, clearly it was meant to deceive or harm? So I'm wondering, how do we deal with that, that, that phenomenon? Because it's, it's about the way the internet works. It's about how things lose their context. Um, and that seems like a particularly complicated one, Evelyn, for how we apply these tests. Um, of human rights and how we apply platform frameworks. Um, so I wonder if anyone wants to weigh in on that. Maybe I'll ask Evelyn if that's something you'd like to um, think about. Is it something about labeling these more aggressively and retaining that labeling to go to your kind of framework? What are ways we could approach this problem of loss of context, but it's done deliberately? Yeah, I'll just give some short thoughts and then, um, of course, uh, turn over to the other panelists. Um, you know, I think something we'd need to ask is if there were to be a rule that required marking of manipulated media, would the creators of satire feel that has, you know, undermined their initial thrust or, or moment, you know? And I know on, on your first um, part of this series, there was a, 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 a panelist who works on deep reckonings, and she's very transparent up front that what she's doing is, is not real, and she doesn't feel it undermines it. She thinks it actually boosts it. Um, so it would be interesting just to, to to engage with creators of satire and parodies and say, if you had to have a marking, would would that take away from the impact of your work, or or you know, could you still proceed? And if and if if we 
you know, get some kind of consensus that we can proceed and that uh, that would be the least intrusive burden on speech rather than having speech, you know, platforms taking down um, satire because they think people can be um, misguided or, or deceived through it. That is something I think to think about. But again, that discussion needs to happen. Great. I'm gonna, we're, we're close to time, so I just want to check, Julie or Bayer, if there's a, a quick comment you'd like to make on that topic. Um, I would, Sorry. Okay, Julie, go on. Yes, I, I think it, it reminds me of, uh, you remember at the time on Twitter, uh, it, there was a debate on whether or not you have to make it obvious that you're par it's a parody account. I know there was one for Nicolas Sarkozy, and I, I can't remember another very prominent figure. So I think, yes, labeling could, I mean, could be interesting uh, to, to, to make sure that you know, the public is aware that um, and is while sharing is also making aware other people that this is not the reality. I think it's a matter of good faith, definitely. Uh, but I agree with Evelyn, this discussion cannot happen with the, the people who create this content and um, and how they perceive the art, because it's also a form of art and a form of expression that has to be, to be respected this way. So. And I was Thank just going to add that, final thought. Uh, yeah, in addition to labeling, I think huge media literacy is important because um, it might be difficult to monitor every single person who is creating satire that is kind of deep faked and all of that. Um, but if we increase the level of media literacy across board that everybody can by themselves verify what is deep faked or shallow fake and stuff like that, would be able to pull back the impact, the negative impact on that gradually. I think media literacy might be one of the ways to go as well. Thank you. That's that's all the time we have for today. I, I think I could talk for hours with you, and I think this is hopefully the start of a conversation um, that is important to have in this community and beyond. So thanks so much to you, Julie, Adebayo, and Evelyn. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for this incredible conversation around building new frameworks for, for human rights, but also perhaps a new kind of punctuation in our visual language as it emerges. You know, we have the quotation mark in text and what is that going to look like as we signal what we are trying to say? Thank you so much, Evelyn Oswald, Julie Awono and Bio Okewo, and uh, thank you to all the colleagues behind the scenes at Witness and at MIT. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Knight Foundation, and to BuzzFeed and Vimeo for media support on this series. I'm gonna hand it back to Sam. Thank you for that great moderation, and uh, you'll give us a heads up on what's next in the Deep Fake series. Thanks, Kat. Um, the next week's episode happens on Thursday at 12 noon um, Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll be continuing our focus on satire, free expression, and human rights globally with a special edition in collaboration with the Witness Brazil team featuring Bruno Sartori, Brazil's leading deepfake satirist who pokes fun at the powerful in Brazil with his compelling deepfakes. Please note that this episode will be in Portuguese, but with live subtitles online and Facebook and options to view it afterwards with um, subtitles. And we'll be sharing a notice to everyone who's registered at wit.to uh, wit slash deepfakery. Uh, please register there if you haven't about a special edition later this month focused on manipulated media in the US elections. Thanks everyone.